Hello, my name is Luke Topple, and in this video I'm going to talk about chaos theory in the lens that Edward Lorenz originally presented it in his paper about deterministic non-periodic flow. When most people think about chaos theory, they think about a butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil being able to set off a hurricane in Texas. And while this is an interesting analogy, it's not the best way to think about it, especially in the context of weather prediction. In fact, the main idea of chaos theory that actually matters to us is that small changes in initial conditions can result in these huge impacts in our results. Before we get into the proof of the idea of chaos theory, it's, it's helpful to have a little bit of background. So Edward Lorenz in the 1960s had a little bit of trouble with the weather model that he was using. Uh, at this point in history, the weather models were pretty accurate. There was a recent breakthrough in the idea that clouds followed the idea of convection, and there was plenty of data available for scientists to use. And despite all this, Lorenz was still running what he assumed were the same initial parameters, and he was getting these drastically different outputs. Lorenz pondered this for a while, and eventually he was able to write about it in this paper they published titled Deterministic Non-Periodic Flow. Uh, in his paper, he goes through um, some proofs and ideas about how small, minuscule changes in our initial conditions will get a pretty different and unpredictably large or small results. Uh, while his paper is very well written and accessible, uh, there's one section in particular called the instability of non-periodic flow that's really helpful to us in the, in the context of weather prediction. Throughout his paper, he actually goes through some numeric integration of these differential equations that he has, but in terms of figuring out what exactly chaos theory implies, this section is the one that is, is really important in outlining that. Uh, for the rest of this video, I'm going to go through this section and a small little proof that he does right away with just a few definitions, and this will get us some insight into how these small input changes can give us these different results. For Lorenz to make this proof, he decided to work in a phase space, which is basically an m-dimensional space where each point in phase space represents some possible state that the system can take. As time, as time goes on, these states evolve, and those evolutions are represented by a moving particle in phase space as a function of time. For us, we, all that's important about our phase space is that it's bounded in some region R, and that each point that's in R must remain in R as time goes on. Uh, so basically, our system doesn't get anything added to it or taken away from it as time goes on. It's, it, it is how it is in the beginning, and it is how it is at the end. So our first definition is that of a limit point, which basically is a point that any trajectory, uh, trajectory being a moving particle that represents the evolution of a, of a state, approaches arbitrarily closely, arbitrarily often. Now, because our phase space is continuously deformed throughout time, each trajectory that passes through a point is also a limit point of that trajectory. And if we were to take all of those limit points and make a trajectory out of them, we just call that the limiting trajectory. If what tends to happen in the real world is, is true in our system, that a trajectory is contained amongst its, amongst its limiting trajectory, we call it a central trajectory. If not, then we just say it's a non-central trajectory. Next on our definitions, we have a stable trajectory. A trajectory is considered stable at one point if any other trajectory that passes close to that point remains close as time goes on. Now, our phase space is continuously deformed as time varies, so any trajectory that's stable at one point is stable at every point, and we call that a stable trajectory. Now, conversely, if a trajectory is unstable at one point, then it must be unstable at every point. Since it was stable at one point, then it would be a stable trajectory. Last but not least, we have the idea of a periodic trajectory. Now, since each through each point we have a unique trajectory that passes through it, any trajectory that passes through a point that it previously passed must continue to repeat that same behavior that it did the last time it passed through it, meaning it's a periodic trajectory. We call a trajectory quasi-periodic if for some time interval it remains arbitrarily close to points that it's already passed. Instead of passing directly through them, it's just pretty close to them. So basically, a quasi-periodic trajectory 
has a special case, it's a periodic trajectory. And any trajectory that's not quasi-periodic is just called non-periodic. Because quasi-periodic trajectories have to come close to points that they've previously passed, if a trajectory is non-periodic, that means that it cannot remain close to points that it's previously passed as time goes on to infinity. If it did, we would call it quasi-periodic. So with these three definitions, the limit trajectory, the stable trajectory, and the periodic trajectory, we can build a theorem that any trajectory with a stable limiting trajectory is quasi-periodic. While Lorenz's explanation of this is very technical, basically, if we have p naught of t as a limiting trajectory of p of t, there must be points that p naught of t and p of t are close to each other at since they're a limiting trajectory, those points being the limit points of p of t. Since the limiting trajectory is a stable trajectory, any other trajectory that passes close to it, like p of t, must remain close to it as time goes on. Since our limiting trajectory must approach its limit points arbitrarily closely arbitrarily often, our other trajectory, the one that is must remain close to the limiting trajectory since it's stable, must also pass those same points arbitrarily closely arbitrarily often. Now, since this trajectory passes close to some points arbitrarily often, it's quasi-periodic. Since a central trajectory is just a special case of a limiting trajectory, a stable central trajectory must also be quasi-periodic. And the contrapositive of this, which actually means something to us, is that any non-periodic central trajectory is unstable. The important part about this means that any two trajectories that start close to each other will inherently not remain close to each other as time goes on. We don't know how far apart they'll drift, but we do know that they must not remain close to each other as time goes on. Therefore, if we have two trajectories that start close to each other, like the measured state of a system and the actual state of a system, as time goes on, those trajectories do not have to remain close to each other. Therefore, the state of the system that we predict might not have any meaning after a certain time interval. We don't know how long until it's meaningless, but we do know that at some specific arbitrarily large or small time, our prediction will not match the system. So with weather prediction, we have this problem of our measured and predicted system not matching the actual system. And it's probably pretty important for us to figure out when this is so that we can put some more uncertainty into our forecasts. So the way to do this is to compare our calculated forecasts to some more trivial cases. In his book on prediction, The Signal and the Noise, Nate Silver compares forecasts to the null conditions of climatology and persistence. Basically what these are uh, is climatology being what has happened on this day in the past, and persistence being the idea that what happened yesterday will happen again tomorrow. As you can see, the forecast that we calculate does do better than both of these as far as average error on temperature until about nine days when we're better off taking a yearly average than actually putting together a forecast. So what this means then is that any weather forecast that we make really doesn't mean anything after about a week. The uncertainties as a result of chaos theory tend to manifest themselves more as time goes on and therefore we shouldn't really trust any temperature forecast that tells us what the temperature is going to be after a week because we have all this uncertainty. So even though we're not able to accurately predict weather based on initial conditions, we can still put together a probabilistic weather forecast. And the way to do this to do this is through the use of ensemble forecasting. Basically what ensemble forecasting is is a combination of all of the possible initial conditions of the state based on what we measured. So if we measured our temperature with an accuracy of only three decimal places, it'll go plus or minus one of each uh, end of those three decimal places in order to kind of get a good idea of how certain our weather forecasts can be. The idea for this being that if we can get every single possible combination of our initial conditions to within our uncertainty and in every single one of the forecasts run on those it's supposed to rain, then we're fairly certain that it's going to rain. 
However, if maybe in 40% of those forecasts we only get precipitation, maybe there's a 40% chance of rain. Ultimately, the meteorologist still has the last say on what's going to happen in a day based on the forecasts that come from our advanced computer models. For more information on deterministic non-periodic flow and the origins of chaos theory, I highly recommend that you actually read Lorenz's paper. It's very accessible, very well written, even though it's dense and kind of technical, it's still pretty easy to follow. Also for forecasting in general, uh, Nate Silver's book, The Signal and the Noise, has some really interesting stuff specifically about weather that's interesting to check out.